Okay, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today here at SEPS or online via our live stream. I would like to welcome all of you to the second edition of our MEDAM seminar in the year 2019. MEDAM is the Mercator Dialogue on Asylum and Migration. The project constitutes a research alliance of SEPS, the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, and the Migration Policy Center in Florence, and is funded by Stiftung Mercator. I'm Andreas Backhaus. I'm a research fellow here at SEPS and a member of the MEDAM project. Today, Jevat Girat Aksoy is joining us in order to inform us on the self-selection of refugees into Europe and on the big overarching question, who migrates where? Jevat is a principal economist in the office of the chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London, a research fellow at the London School of Economics, a research associate at AITSA Institute of Labor Economics and at the World Economic Forum. Jevat holds a PhD in economics from the University of London and his research focuses on labor market inequalities, family formation, migration and globalization. Together with Professor Panu Putvara at the IFO Center for International Institutional Comparisons and Migration Research, Jevat has analyzed a unique set of surveys that were collected by the International Organization for Migration around the peak of the recent migration inflows into Europe in the years 2015 and 2016. For the next half an hour, Jevat will delight us with a presentation of their findings, then I will follow up with a short discussion, and then we will have plenty of time left to take your questions, both from the room and from the outside, if you are watching us on the live stream and if you're using Twitter, but more to that when we are there. Now I give the floor to Jevat. Please enjoy the presentation. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Savat. I'm a, as Andreas said, I'm a principal economist at TBRD. Um, thanks for being here. I know it's around 4 p.m. and it's late in the evening, so I will try to make a uh, nice presentation. Hopefully, you will like it and you will have some uh, takeaways when you leave this room. Um, so this is a joint work with Pana Putwara, who's at uh, IFO and University of Munich. And as the title clearly suggests, in this paper, we try to understand self-selection of refugees into Europe. So what do we mean by self-selection is that uh, sociodemographic characteristics of refugees and irregular migrants who, who made it to Europe. So this is a paper basically we, uh, we started a year ago. Now we got more data. And so the aim of the paper is overall to understand uh, self-selection in three stages. The first stage is self-selection into Turkey as the main transit country, then self-selection into Europe, and then specifically among those who made it to Europe, these are Eastern European countries and transit countries, who made it to Germany. So self-selection into, again, self-selection into Turkey, self-selection into Europe, and among those who made it to Europe, who goes to Germany. Um, and the usual disclaimer, uh, applies, the views presented in this presentation are ours with PANU and don't necessarily uh, reflect the views of EBRD and IOM. So what we know is that about 66 million people were uh, forcibly uh, displaced at the end of uh, 2016 and total number of people seeking uh, safety as refugees reached nearly uh, 23 million and more than half of these people actually come from uh, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Syria. And what we know uh, descriptively and from the previous studies, uh, most, most of these refugees actually uh, stay in developing neighboring countries. But if you look at this graph, just in uh, 2015, more than one million refugees uh, came to Europe. And about uh, a vast majority of them actually came to Europe from Turkey they, made, they took the, the sea passage from Turkey to Greece, and they landed the, the Greek islands, and from there, they made their way to Europe. So this is very important because, and this refugee crisis is very different than what we had in 1990s, because um, first thing, when you look at the surveys, Europeans often think that refugees now who, who are in Europe, they are cult culturally distant from, uh, from Europeans. And the second reason is that um, Europe was already fragmented with the financial crisis and inequality, and this refugee crisis had further uh, political implications for European societies. So 
we, we think that this makes it all the more important to understand the sociodemographic characteristics of refugees and uh, irregular migrants. Because if we know basically the motivations and uh, sociodemographic characteristics of migrants, that will help us to distinguish between the refugee crisis and challenges associated with irregular migrants. Because in our data set, what we can, what we can observe, people who escape due to war and conflict, and then people who escape due to economic reasons. These are the people generally migrated from uh, Africa and mainly Sub-Saharan Africa. And the second thing is, knowing these characteristics will help us to plan integration policies, and eventually this will contribute to social stability and economic stability in host countries. And, and related to, without knowing the sociodemographic characteristics and skill levels of uh, refugees and irregular migrants, that will be hard to plan optimal uh, labor market integration policies. I will give you some uh, suge policy suggestions at, at, the, at the end of the presentation. And one important thing that mostly this, this, this is overlooked in the, in the literature, the wider the gap between who remain in the origin country, let's say Syria, and the number of and, and skilled Syrians who made it to Europe, it will be harder in the future to rebuild their country. Because what we know that the refugees tend to stay, but once they leave, they tend to stay in their uh, destination countries, in Western European countries. So in this paper, we asked three questions. The first question is, what are the sociodemographic characteristics of refugees and irregular migrants? The second question is, how do these characteristics differ by major conflict versus minor or uh, non-conflict countries? And the last question is, how do these characteristics differ by intended destination country level characteristics? So to do so, what we do, we use confidential data from IAM from 2015 and 2016. And then we combine this data with Gallup World Polls, where we have inf uh, information on baseline population characteristics. I will give you more details uh, on this later on. So let me give you the punchlines. Uh, and let me tell you what we actually find in the paper so far. And keep in mind that this is a work in progress and new results will be, will be come, uh, coming up very soon. Um, so what we find is that refugees escaping major conflicts tend to be highly educated compared to their uh, national average. And I will explain you why that will be the case later. And probability of emigration increases in tertiary education for both men and women in the full sample. So educated people are the ones, compared to the national average, are the ones who, may, who make it to Europe. And probability of emigration is higher for men, for younger, younger people, and for singles. It is, it's kind of like a style aspect. And it, this result is actually very uh, similar to economic migrants. When you look at the literature on economic migrants, you actually see a similar pattern. Uh, men, young people, and also singles tend to migrate. When we look at the countries with minor or no conflict, uh, men with secondary education are less likely to emigrate than men with primary education or less. So there we basically find a U-shaped relationship. Either very um, low-skilled people migrate or very high-skilled people migrate from uh, non-conflict countries. And when we look at women from minor uh, and no conf or no conflict countries, we actually find that women with tertiary education are significantly more likely to emigrate. And we think that maybe that, is the, that, that might be driven by the fact that women return, even though returns to education, in theory, should be higher in uh, developing countries for women, but maybe because of labor market discrimination and other, other negative labor market characteristics, these women actually prefer migrating abroad, even if returns to education is actually lower. Um, on average, what we actually find is that predicted long income strongly increases the probability of emigration from all country groups. Uh, when we look at the sorting patterns with respect to inequality levels of the, the countries, we find that migrants with tertiary education are more likely to choose more unequal countries. And we have this, uh, this finding, which is very descriptive, but I, we still think that it's very, it's very inform informative. We find that 
migrants who are educated to primary and secondary level are more likely to choose countries that have lower unemployment rates, better integration policies measured by MIPEX index, and faster asylum process and labor market access. So basically, we, we build on uh, literature on self-selection of uh, refugees and irregular migrants. Um, our main contribution is we provide the first large-scale evidence on refugees and irregular migrants and their, their demographic characteristics and their sorting patterns. And, and we build a theoretical model. Today, I won't go through that. Uh, we, mathematically, we are trying to basically explain why people with tertiary education are likely to go to uh, Europe and uh, others, should, uh, others are more likely to stay in their uh, origin countries. So I will basically be able to tell you now migration to Europe. Then I will tell you more about our data and empirical strategy. Then I will show you some results and I will conclude. So this map basically uh, shows us the main migrant uh, land routes and Mediterranean sea routes to Europe. So we have data from uh, Central Mediterranean Line and Eastern Mediterranean Line. Um, so Eastern Mediterranean route starts from Turkey, and from Turkey people take the sea passages uh, to Greece, and from Greece they make their way to Europe, or Western Europe. And Central Mediterranean basically uh, route starts from Sub-Saharan Africa. People kind of meet in Libya, which is the main departure point from Libya. People make to, uh, people go to Italy, and most of the actually people uh, who make it to Italy in our data set more than 80% of them, they want to stay in Italy. So Italy for them as the main destination country. So looking at the, the reasons for why people actually left their uh, origin countries, here is, here is a descriptive chart. It's, 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 I think it's very informative in the sense that people who escape from major conflict countries that we know like uh, Syria, Sudan, Iraq, Somalia, and Afghanistan, vast majority of them actually cite conflict and persecution for, as, a, as the main reason for leaving their country. If you look at the other, uh, other end of the scale, people from uh, Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Pakistan, they, they, they tend to cite economic reasons and limited access to amenities as main reasons for leaving their uh, origin country. So what this suggests, yes, there are some people in our data set that, who are refugees, they escape their countries due to war and conflict, but we also have substantial uh, number of economic migrants who escape their countries either for economic reasons or limited access to uh, labor markets, but also uh, limited access to amenities. So our data sets, we use multiple data sets. I will tell you the main ones now. We use uh, full monitoring surveys from IOM. Uh, which is a confidential data we obtained through a um, uh, specific agreement. Um, so the surveys are conducted at transit points. I have detailed information on these transit points, but to give you an example, IAM has detailed information on where people actually land. So they go to these points and they survey people, migrants there. And these surveys are conducted in 11 different languages. And one thing they emphasize is that they make sure that interviewers come from diverse cultural backgrounds and, 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 and different, different nationalities. The reason for that, so that migrants will actually will feel comfortable talking to interviewers. And so the survey aims to be representative of the nationalities, sex and age structure of migrants arri arriving in Europe through East Central and Eastern European uh, migrant routes. And I will show you some evidence that actually they do a good job in providing a representative survey of migrants. Uh, so what we know uh, in the survey, we know migrants' demographic characteristics, employment status before migration, key transit points they, they basically uh, pass through throughout their journey, um, reasons for uh, leaving the place of residence, intended destinations, and how much they spend on their way to Europe. So we use, uh, currently we use four waves of uh, flow monitoring surveys, but I will show you mainly results from the first three waves. The first wave was conducted uh, 
between October 2015 and December 2015 in Croatia, Greece, Slovenia, and uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Um, the second wave was conducted mainly in, in Western Balkans, and the third wave was conducted in Italy, and the last wave was conducted in Turkey. And in our sample, which no age, age with no age restriction, we have about 19,000 observations provided by 19 different um, nationalities with at least 100 respondents. We restrict our sample to use at least 100 respondents to get, gain some statistical power when we run the analysis. So the main question you might ask, yes, we will use the survey that are conducted at the transit points, but to what extent the surveys are actually representative? So what we do, we basically take, we calculate shares in flow monitoring surveys in terms of gender, age, age distribution, and nationality. And we also use data from uh, Eurostat, official asylum uh, statistics. Then what we actually do, we compare shares from flow monitoring survey and shares that we actually obtain from official uh, Eurostat database. And then it actually turns out that the shares are very similar. Uh, when it comes to uh, shares by nationality. And when we look at the row correlation, the row correlation is about uh, 0.98. So, of course, we are not saying that flow monitoring survey is fully representative of migrants who came to Europe, but actually, the survey does a great job in providing a representative sample of uh, migrants. So some basic descriptives about uh, the migrants who, who came to Europe, the average age is 32. About 80% of them actually um, males, 60% uh, of them, nearly 60% of them are actually married. 25% uh, of them have a tertiary education or more. And about 63% of them were employed before uh, migrating. And again, a vast majority of them left their country due to uh, conflict or persecution, but this figure masks huge variation uh, across countries. What we do basically, we take flow monitoring survey, and this survey gives us the demographic characteristics of migrants, and then we combine flow monitoring survey with Gallup word polls. This Gallup word polls gives us the sociodemographic characteristics at the baseline in the country of origin. So what we do then, we pull these two data sets based on 19 source countries we have in our data set, in our data. Then we create a migrant indicator variable, which takes a value of one if the individual is in flow monitoring survey, and zero if the individual is in Gallup word polls. And then we basically use this pseudo cross-sectional uh, sample to understand, uh, to, run, to run our, our analysis. And then of course what we do, we, uh, we basically harmonize each variable in Gallup word poll to make it comparable with, uh, with the flow monitoring surveys. So how, how do we define countries by major conflict, uh, minor conflict, or no conflict? So we basically rely on Uppsala uh, conflict data program. So if countries have 1,000 or more battle-related uh, deaths in any of the years between 2009 and 2014, these countries are major conflict countries. The minor conflict countries uh, are, the, are the countries with 25 to 999 battle-related deaths in any of the years between 2009 and 2014. And the last one is no conflict countries. They, they, these countries are the countries that didn't experience any major conflict. So our empirical strategy is very straightforward. Um, so we run this um, linear probability models. Refugee migrant takes a value of one, as I said earlier, if individual is flow monitoring survey and zero otherwise. We control for uh, age dummies, education dummies, and, and labor market status before migration. And we have country dummies. Country dummies allow us to compare the same people, Syrians who's, who stayed in Syria, or Syrians, uh, the baseline characteristics of Syrians, to those who made it to Europe. And in all specifications, you will see the relevant ex excluded category is those in uh, Gallup word polls. So the first result I will show you will tell, you, uh, will tell us um, self-selection into Europe from origin country. So 
we basically report results for education, employment status before migration, age, and marital status. There are three columns in each table. First column shows us all results for all countries, that is major conflict countries and minor and no co or no conflict countries. Second column focuses on major conflict countries only. And the last column focuses on minor or no conflict countries. Uh, so if you look at the, the full sample, we actually see that migrants who made it to Europe are significantly more likely to have tertiary education and secondary education. And we refer to this as migrants are positively selected with respect to their education level. So compared to the, their baseline population characteristics, migrants who made it to Europe are actually more educated. Um, again, they are significantly more likely to be uh, men. Uh, they are significantly more likely to be uh, single. And they are significantly more likely to be younger on average. When we look at the second column, uh, what we actually see that people again are positively selected with respect to uh, education. So they are more likely to have secondary education or tertiary education. But when we look at the last column, we see that there is this U-shaped relationship. Either very educated people leave or uh, uneducated people leave, but the point estimate on uh, secondary education is very small, so we don't find any selection pattern there. Then we, when we look at uh, just male sample only, when we look at the male sample, we actually see that, again, the, this positive selection with respect to uh, education. And when we look at the, the minor or no conflict countries, this positive selection with respect to tertiary education, this effect disappears. But what we actually see, some limited evidence on uh, negative selection with respect to uh, secondary education. Uh, when we look at women, again, for the first column, full, full sample and uh, the major conflict sample, the patterns remain the same. When we look at uh, minor or no conflict countries, as I, as I referred to these results earlier, uh, women with tertiary education are significantly more likely to migrate to Europe. So then what we try to understand, uh, basically income distributions of migrants, single migrants, and, and, and single non-migrants. So what we actually see here, when we look at the full sample, migrants are positively selected with, with respect to their uh, predicted incomes. And then if you look at this graph, basically you see this scholastic uh, relationship that migrants' income over the income distributions uh, scholastically dominates non-migrants' income. When we look at migrants who migrated from major conflict countries, this pattern remains the same. When we look at migrants who, who left from minor or no conflict countries, we actually see that th this pattern disappears for men, but for women, this pattern remains the same. So where, with respect to predicted incomes, the migrants are positively selected. The next stage is we try to understand who stayed in Turkey and who basically made it, to, who, who decided to go to Europe. We run a similar an, uh, analysis. Um, there we actually see that when we look at the, the full sample, remember when it comes to migrating to Europe, we find this positive selection with respect to education. So compared to baseline population, people are more likely to have uh, secondary and tertiary education. When we look at Turkey, Turkey sample, this, we, this pattern disappears. So when we look at tertiary education, there is no effect in the full sample. But when we look at the secondary education, people are, tend to be negatively selected with respect to secondary education. Uh, when we look at major conflict countries, we find this U-shaped relationship. And when we look at minor and no conflict countries, we find this negative relationship that p migrants are negatively selected. Looking at the other demographic characteristics, pattern remains more or less the same. Uh, when we look at men only, again, we find similar results. There is no strong selection patterns with respect to education among migrants who stayed in Turkey. When we look at women, um, there we find strong uh, positive uh, selection with respect to education. So women 
are positively selected with respect to their ter tertiary education, and these are the women who, who basically stay in Turkey. And again, when we look at the, their income distributions, we actually see that they are positively selected with respect to their uh, predicted income. So next thing we look at in the paper is the role of border controls. Here, we basically try to understand to what extent border enforcement and border policies that was imposed between 2015 and 2016 in Europe uh, affected migrants' uh, intended uh, destination country choices. So on the top row, you basically see migrants' intended destination countries. So these countries are Germany, Italy, France, Sweden, Austria, and UK. And on the basically uh, very left uh, column, you see the, the policies. So what we do, we know the dates of these policies, and we look at before and after. So we look at the, uh, in the survey, we look at migrants who were interviewed before Austria quota announcement, and then migrants who, who were interviewed after the Austria quota announcement, and then we try to understand to what extent these policies affected migrants' intended destination countries. So to start with, let's look at column two. Uh, so these are, these quotas should only affect uh, continental European countries, but not Italy, because these policies are related to uh, sorting into continental European countries. Remember, most of the migrants who came who came from Sub-Saharan Africa to Italy, basically they want to stay in uh, Italy. So if you look at the second column, these policies don't affect migrants' destination choices. So you can think this as kind of like a placebo test. Uh, but you, if you look at, the, for example, the first column for Germany, once Austria announces quota, migrants are 16 percentage point more likely to state that they want to go to Germany. This is a huge effect. Um, for example, when S Slovenia and Macedonia impose border tightening, and about 60, and the point estimate is about, again, 16 percentage point, migrants and irregular migrants and refugees, 16 percentage point less likely to state that they want to go to Germany. Um, and civilian border controls, again, basically f changes uh, migrants' uh, destination choices and they, they want to go to Germany. And for France, we, we find limited effects. For UK, again, we find limited effects. But uh, the f for Germany, Sweden, and Austria, we find strong effects uh, in the sense that border control policies really sh uh, shift migrants' uh, intended destinations. The, last, the next thing we do is we try to understand migrants' intended destination countries and intended, uh, intended countries based on country-level characteristics. So, for example, we know the migrant wants to go to Germany, and then we try to understand to what extent they want to go to Germany that has something to do with the unemployment rate in Germany. Or to what extent the X country in Europe has a better integration policy. That's what, try to, that's what we try to understand here. So, what we actually see that those with primary education and secondary education, they are significantly less likely to go to countries which, has, uh, which have higher unemployment rates. And when we look at the second column, there we have migrant integration index. And then there we actually see that migrants with primary and secondary education, they really want to go to countries that have better uh, integration policies. And they prefer countries with uh, shorter as asylum uh, procedures and duration. And, and basically, country-level characteristics also uh, seem to play a role when it, uh, when it comes to migrants' intended destinations. So basically, to conclude, um, what we actually find is that refugees and irregular migrants are more likely to be single, male, and young with vast cross-country uh, variation in the motivation for migration. Refugees and irregular migrants from major conflict countries are relatively highly educated compared to their national average. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are more educated from their European counterparts, but compared to baseline population, they are definitely more educated. 
Um, border controls seem to affect the intended destination countries of refugees and irregular migrants. And asylum seekers and, and refugees and irregular migrants uh, with lower level of education, they are more likely to aim for countries that have lower unemployment rates, better integration policies, faster asylum process, and labor market access. So you might think like, yes, after all this, uh, do you have any uh, policy implications or main policy takeaways? Um, so we think that, as, as I said at the, at the very beginning, when I, when I, uh, during the introduction, refugees and irregular migrants, their socio-demographic characteristics have implications for rebuilding their home countries. If the, this gap in skills get larger, then it will be harder in the future to rebuild their uh, origin countries or home countries. Um, and schooling or training as part of integration policies need to be adapted to, to their initial skills. Um, so that's why it's very important to know occupational distribution of refugees and irregular migrants and, and, and their uh, level of education. And one thing is mostly uh, overlooked in, in the discussion, young migrants can actually revitalize the labor force in Asian countries, especially in Eastern Europe. And, and the refugees from high recognition countries, such as Syria, Afghanistan, or major conflict countries, should actually receive early access to language courses and other training. Uh, so that these people will be integrated in society earlier rather than later. And on this note, I conclude. I'm on time or? Okay. Thanks a lot, Severt, also for keeping the time uh, so very much. Um, let me add um, some brief policy implications, comments from uh, my side. Quick summary, so you're looking at data on migrants arriving in Europe in 2015 or 16 through the central Mediterranean route. Your sample is representative of the aggregate migrant flows at the same time. Um, migrants from conflict countries is your main finding are positively selected with uh, respect to their education. Male economic migrants, meaning migrants from low conflict countries, are not positively self-selected, but female ones are. And the low-skilled migrants appear to head for EU countries with better labor market integration opportunities, and the border policies of individual EU member countries um, have apparently influenced um, these flows to a certain degree. So let me first say something on the flow monitoring service from the IOM that you have used here. So one really, one figure that really convinced me that these are representative of the flows is your correlation between the nationalities in these surveys and the Eurostat asylum applications by nationality, meaning if there were 23% Syrians in the survey, also 23% of asylum applications in the same year were um, handed in by Syrians. Um, one thing where maybe this correlation is not so strong is that 77% of the surveyed migrants stated conflict or persecution as reason for migration, and this shares actually more than 90% among the Syrians, uh, Afghans, and Iraqis in the survey. And does this share correspond to the later recognition rates in the European asylum system? And there, um, there are some disparities, let's say, so in 2016, um, the recognition rates of Syrians in the EU were, was really high, 98%. Um, for Afghans, it was just 55.8%. For Iraqis, it was slightly more, 62.6%. So, of course, we have to weigh this by numbers, but that would really be an interesting thing to look into. Um, do the reasons for entering Europe um, correspond to the asylum shares granted later on? And if they don't, there could be several reasons. For example, um, Migrants do not assess, assess their chances of gaining asylum correctly. Could also be the European countries are not issuing asylum grants um, accordingly to the reasons uh, for migration. So not everyone who is actually persecuted does receive asylum. Or there could also be people in the sample uh, who maybe do not state their reasons for migration um, completely accurately. You actually referred to this. Um, so one of the most important policy implications that you also mentioned already, 
we are looking at people coming into Europe, but what are the implications of the self-selection that you find for those left behind in the countries of origin or in the refugee camps, for example, in Jordan, Lebanon, um, or people who have reached Turkey. Because in some sense, even though they are all refugees in a difficult situation, the better educated and wealthier refugees are better off in comparison to other refugees in at least two dimensions. So first, they actually appear to have a better possibility to emigrate from refugee camps or from Syria, because maybe they have um, higher savings to make this journey. And once they reach the EU, they also have better chances of being integrated into the European labor markets, um, which is quite predictive then for their future outcomes um, in Europe. So what can or what should be done for those who stay behind? You mentioned this problem will um, just get bigger if this positive self-selection grows stronger. We have resettlement programs to resettle people directly from refugee camps from neighboring countries into the EU um, with a small number of people actually being resettled. It would be interesting to look into is there also this positive selection um, or are these more representative? And what do we know um, what should we know about the effectiveness of support for refugees left behind in the refugee camps? And to your last finding that border policies do seem to influence migration flows. I remember in 2015, at least in Germany, some people questioned that border policies actually do that. Um, so my guess is this likely will remain kind of the means of last resort for member states if there should be a new uh, migration crisis or a failure to uh, secure the EU external borders. So what are the implications for the sustainability of the Schengen Agreement? And what I think you could actually test with your data would be, do the border policies um, change the intentions of migrants who are fleeing for reasons of persecution to the same degree as they change the reasons for um, uh, economic migrants? Okay, and um, I will give you a moment to uh, reply. And then we move to the uh, Q&A involving everyone here in the room. And if you are watching us from the outside, you can actually um, send us your question, if you like, via Twitter by sending it to uh, our team member, Ahmed Wali, on his um, Twitter account, Ahmed Wali underscore ya. I will just leave it there for a few minutes, and then we will read out your question in the room and try to answer it also as best as we can. Works? Okay, great. Um, thanks a lot for comments. I think I think there are, there's so much to do. Um, some of the stuff you actually pointed out, I just did a couple of days ago, so great. Uh, so recognition rates, uh, we haven't checked this, I think, the reason that we refer to the shares to understand to what extent our data is representative of migrants who made it to Europe. Um, and there, what we look at first time asylum applications. So if that's what matters for us, uh, if they stay and leave, it is, I think what we are trying to look at, the initial self-selection of refugees. And implicit assumption, I think a vast, major, ma vast majority of them will stay in Europe for a long time. Recognition rates, I think with the, if data is out there, probably we can look at this, and probably the data is available, right? Okay, that's something we can definitely do. Um, why educated people leave their countries? So in, I, I didn't show you the theoretical model today. Um, the one, but just intuitively, intuitive explanation is that even if you are educated in your home country and but assuming that the returns to education in Iraq will be much higher for an Iraqi person than Germany, right? But once you face uh, that threat or persecution, then you basically, the better choice is basically just to leave. That's how we model our theoretical model um, and self-selection of refugees. And then entire basically main mechanism goes through returns to education. And then when we look at one thing we cannot incorporate our, in our model is the, the finances. So what I mean by this, if you're educated, 
that means education and income is strongly correlated, right? And that also means probably you have means to migrate and make uh, finance your trip to Europe. Or you're educated than other people on average. Maybe you speak a uh, different language so that you can basically figure out the, how to deal with smugglers, how to find uh, routes to Europe, and so on. So these are two potential explanations, income and basically other skills uh, outside of model. But our main model, main explanation is once people uh, face uh, life threats, even if returns to education, finance, uh, re returns to income is higher in or their origin countries, they just leave. Um, that's, that's the main explanation. Uh, what should be done for those uh, who stay behind? I think that, I mean, it's easier said than done, but I think to end the conflict. Uh, one interesting thing, so I don't have any strong suggestions there, unfortunately, um, but you ask about to what extent refugees actually do well in the camps. Uh, a friend of mine, actually, Thomas Jin from Stanford, he does, he has a paper where he basically compares refugees in Jordan who live in camps and refugees in Jordan who live outside of camps. And when we look at their income and life satisfaction, actually, refugees, those who live in camps, they do better on, on, on many aspects. So, and this is a very good data set collected uh, with World Bank. I think it, it, it's, it's a credible study to, to refer to when, when, when it comes to understanding to what extent refugees uh, who stay in camps, uh, how, how, the, how their lives, basically. It, it's, it's a good study to look at. Um, so border policies, we look at refugees and economic migrants, and they respond exactly the same way. So it, 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 is, it, is, it is surprising, but at the same time, it is very assuring in the sense that our survey is actually does a good job in getting the right answers from respondents. Because in a couple of occasions, some people from audience said, to what extent people actually uh, give you the right answer? But the, the, our answer is that, first thing, when I am uh, interviewers, when they approach uh, refugees and irregular migrants, they basically say, that's not going to, it is a survey for administrative reason, and it's not going to affect your uh, asylum application. And and obviously, these are voluntary survey. To some extent, what we actually see that men are more likely to respond to these surveys. Uh, but actually, both refugees and uh, economic migrants, going back to your question, respond to these uh, shocks, basically. Um, and I think I cover all your comments. If I am missing something, please let me know. No, thanks. So now we open the floor, and we pass around the microphone. Please use the microphone in any case, because otherwise the people online cannot hear you. So uh, if someone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, hi, I just had a question about the data that you used Sorry. for your... Speak really into the mic. Yes, is this better? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, I had a question about the data you used for your research, um, and specifically about their methodology. Do you know anything about the, the precautions they took to ensure that migrants knew that the things that they were putting into the survey or telling the interview or whatever were not going to potentially come back to, you know, reflect on their asylum claim or whatever? So if they're revealing, you know, where they come from and what type of migrant they are and what type of education they have, how they reassured migrants that they could truly be truthful? Um, I think there are a couple of answers for that. I mean, like all surveys, people can lie, and we don't really know if they tell the truth or lie. Um, but when they approach uh, migrants, they say this out loud multiple times. This is a voluntary survey. This is anonymous, right? So you cannot actually track back, this in, back to these individuals. Um, and then they basically, as I said earlier, they they say it's not going to affect your application, asylum application. And if you look at our results with uh, country characteristics, there we actually find strong sorting patterns with respect to country characteristics. If my 
my impression is that if actually Magnus were lying, then these results wouldn't line up so logically in the sense that less educated people want to go to countries that have lower unemployment rates, better integration policies, and so on. So I, yes, maybe the, some people actually don't tell the truth, but just looking at the survey and working with this data, it looks pretty reliable. But that's a good point, thank you. Hello, uh, Litan Prano from the European Commission. I just wanted to ask you one question. You said that the refugees that uh, stay in the camps uh, did better in terms of a number of indicators. Can you explain better in which way they, they fare better and compared to which uh, author, uh, comparator group? Um, to start with, it is not my study, it is my friend's study. I can send you the details of this working paper is available and I can put you in touch with him. What I remember is that in terms of income, in terms of earnings, refugees do better. In terms of female employment, female uh, refugees do better because most likely they work in, in camps. It is easier for them to find jobs there. Uh, in terms of uh, various dimension of life satisfaction and optimism, they do better. Uh, so these are just comparing refugees who stay in, in camps and who stay outside. Um, but that's all I, I remember for the moment. But I can send you the, the paper and then I can put you in touch with, with the author of the paper. So, sorry, I'm telling you, asking the question because it runs a bit counter to the uh, new approach for refugee protection to argue that refugees do better when they are in camps. Depends on which indicators, I guess, and mm -hmm. what comparator group. No, I, I completely agree and I think I've, I've, I, find it, I've, I find it surprising as well. And Honestly, I think he found it surprising as well, and that's why I think they did a lot of robustness checks to make sure that these patterns are, are correct and they stay there, uh, but the results seem to be very uh, robust. Yes, good, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Altekoster. Um I have a question, maybe I missed something. But it seems to me that you, in your uh, study, you're very much focusing on the refugee Im immigrants in the aftermath of the Syrian war. And you're very much or mainly focusing on the Middle East refugees so coming from, extending to Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran. But what is completely out of the scope are the Africans. I mean, what you call the sub-Saharan route going via Italy. Is there a reason why this group is left out of your consideration? Because that group is also covering uh, a bigger, a larger range of years. Here you're focusing on 2016, more or less, 2015, 16. Um, I think the main reason is data unavailability. Uh, we don't have da good data on refugees. And I mean, this data set is very unique. It's not perfect, but it is very unique in the sense that you get to observe sociodemographic characteristics of refugees and their intended destinations and so on. Uh, when it comes to migrants from Africa, I'm not aware of any data set that would allow us to do a detailed analysis. We do with our data sets the best we can do, uh, but again, vast majority of migrants in this time interval who, who came to Europe were actually were coming from uh, Middle East. So it's not that we are ignoring this part of the population on purpose, it's just we don't have the right data set to examine this. But I mean, then you are not capturing, I, I assume, a, a major group with regard to the non-conflict caused emigration. So the economic, the so-called economic migration, because everybody, I mean, nearly everybody coming from Syria, Iraq, or Afghanistan has conflicts, persecution, discrimination, or these kinds of things. But the Africans, we assume that they're mainly, uh, not everybody, but a lot of them, uh, economic immigrants. Um, so, to, to some extent we do, because in, in our, if you remember the estimation tables, in the third column we focus on minor or uh, no conflict countries, and vast majority of these countries are actually African countries. There what we actually see, 
negative selection with respect to education, meaning that people who migrated from Africa, uh, they tend to be, uh, they tend to have lower level of education compared to their average, the national average. Um, and the explanation for that, um, if you are an educated individual in one Northern African country, I'm not going to name any country here, uh, probably returns to education is, is good. So you have less incentives to leave. But I think there is also risk, risk factor kicks in. If you are a low educated person in North Africa, if there are no, uh, labor market, there are no good labor market prospects for you, that probably makes you a risk taker and you basically have little to lose and you basically make your way to Europe. So we do analyze African migration to some extent, but we cannot fully analyze this migration pattern and look into detail because we don't have the right data set. Someone else? Yes, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question about um, the data you got about um, border control policies. Um, the people who were surveyed, were they already in Europe or were they outside Europe, like in Turkey or somewhere else? They were in Europe and we know the interview dates. So let's say if the, I'm just making up this the date, if the border control was imposed on the 15th of November, let's say, then we compare people uh, who were surveyed 15 of November, before 15 of November and after 15 of November to understand to what extent this specific policy change affected their uh, intended destination. So we know the, the date of the, the survey and the date of the interview and all these people were actually in, already in Europe. So you don't have um, data about, uh, for example, people who were in Turkey and if those policies changed their mind about uh, crossing the border to Europe or staying into Turkey? So those who are in, we have data from Turkey, we just got it recently, so, but what we know, 80% of people, we have in the data set, we have 12,000 uh, respondents, 80% of them want to stay in Turkey. So those who were surveying in Turkey want to stay in Turkey anyways. We haven't looked at to what extent border policies in Europe affect their intended destination country. It's a good point, but it's also also in our to-do list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we still have plenty of time. Someone, has the Twitter community responded? Oh no, we have a question in the room. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have a question on what you said uh, at the very beginning of uh, your presentation um, on countries with minor and no conflict. Um, and uh, you said that women with tertiary um, education are most likely to emigrate. So I was wondering if you have in mind um, what countries uh, showed the highest rates of uh, women emigrating and I was wondering was that um, only regarding irregular um, migration or like in general like in a global context with uh, like all kinds of migration? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, the, it comes with a couple of caveats. Uh, I'm a research fellow at LSE, but I'm s my, my main job is I'm a civil servant. So it's always dangerous for me to name countries outside of research. So I'm not going, and this data is confidential, so I'm not going to, I know the figures, uh, but I'm not going to tell any of these figures. I can give you the explanation. These are basically people who are, or women who are escaping uh, their countries due to mainly for uh, economic reasons or limited access to amenities. These amenities can be healthcare, school, education. Younger women, younger the women, they more care about uh, education and health actually. Uh, and People really also care about roads and infrastructure. So these figures are very striking. And just looking at these descriptive patterns, actually you can come up with some very broad policy implications in the sense that if you invest well uh, in infrastructure in these countries, probably some people will stay, stay back. Uh, 
one explanation, as I said in the presentation, for this female immigration pattern from minor or no conflict countries is that most of these countries are not doing very well uh, in terms of inclusion and gender equality. And most women, I would assume, face huge discrimination in the labor market. And probably these underlying forces actually force women to leave and emigrate their country. Um, and what we actually see, uh, vast majority of these women tend to live with their spouses. Uh, but compared to refugees who left their major conflict countries, share of uh, women who left, uh, single, single women who left from uh, minor or uh, no conflict countries are actually higher. So not only women, married women actually uh, leave from these countries, but also single women leave. And again, one potential uh, explanation is the labor market discrimination and lack of economic inclusion in these countries. Thank you. But that's a great question. Someone else? Has the Twitter community responded? No, it hasn't. Okay. No new followers for you today. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, thank you, Sevel, again um, for your presentation and for answering all our questions here today. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope you have something to take away from this afternoon. And we hope to welcome you sooner here again for our next seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much.